all things made new. Jesus said he came to make all things new, not just some things, all things. Therefore, he established a new covenant, a new covenant which replaces the old covenant. The old covenant is dead. The promise still remains, but the covenant, the rules, the regulations, the things that God set forth for the Jews are ended. Christians should spend most of their time in the word in the new covenant, not in the old. The part of the old covenant that is the promise that God made to Abraham applies to us. And as we are the seed of Abraham today in Christ Jesus, read Galatians, the third chapter, then that is for us as well, but only the promise. The rest is a history, and none of the law or the ordinances apply to us. That is over. Jesus made all things new. In Colossians 2, 13 through 17, and you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements. This is the law and the old requirements that he gave in times past. But the law is the center of it, but not the only part of it. He wiped out the handwriting that was against us. That's what it was. And the requirements, he says, that means all of the rules and regulations, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. This is what we have to get a hold of and realize that this is a new covenant and that's where we're supposed to live. Most Christians have one foot in the old covenant and one foot in the new covenant and it's not the place to be. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, we see that we have a very specific statement, very specific statement. It's one that you're familiar with, but mostly it gets ignored. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin, God made Jesus who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ Jesus. So the new replaces the old. All too often it's taught that the new covenant is an extension or a continuation or a renewal of the old. No, it's not a renewal. It's new. It replaces the old. This must be the focus of every true believer. Don't get bogged down in the old. Live in the new. When we take communion, we drink the new wine, the brand new wine. We don't just do it in a general way. It's establishing the new covenant in Matthew 26, 27, and 28. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 
When Jesus was laid in the tomb following his death on the cross, it was a new tomb. You can find that in Matthew 27, 59 and 60, also in John 19, 41. It was a brand new tomb. No one had ever been laid there before. It was symbolic. There are countless references to the newness of life in the New Testament. In Mark 2, 22, the word says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. You must become that new creature in Christ, dedicated to the covenant that Jesus brought to us that replaced the old. Be a new wineskin. And then when the new wine, the word, the blood, the Holy Spirit of the new covenant is taken into you, it will bear good fruit. It will not just cause destruction. You can't combine the two. They're opposed to each other. Our prayer language is called new tongues in Mark 16, 17, and is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the new birth, the brand new birth. Luke 5, 37 through 39 Jesus says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. In other words, it will destroy you. And this is another place where he says it. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Now here's the, the operable scripture in this passage. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. This is a key in understanding our human nature, which tends to cling to the old. There's an expression in the world, better you, the devil you know than the devil you don't. Meaning, even if something is bad, if something is evil, you're familiar with it, so you'd rather hang on to that than get rid of it and move on to something new that could be better. And this is the way we're in the fallen nature of man, we are. So we have to realize that we cling to the old. People cling to the old, the familiar. And that's what the devil counts on. And so since it's familiar to us and we don't want to let go of it, we stay bogged down in this. And we don't want to know what's going on. We don't want to know what's happening. We just want to stay in, in something that may not be pleasant, may not be what we want, but we're afraid to move on. And fear is what the devil counts on. We must override that fear, that weakness, and embrace the new covenant. It's a fact of human nature that letting go of what we're used to is hard. And following God, Abraham had to do just that. In Genesis 12, 1 and 2... God told Abraham to go to a new country, a new place that he didn't even know, that he was not supposed to look back. He was not supposed to want to stay where he was. He was to move on. And this is what, read it for yourself if you want. Read the whole passage. But what it says is, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, ah, operable, from your family, those who were against God and wanted to, Talk Abraham out of his relationship and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And all through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So until Abraham let go of the old and moved God couldn't use him. Well, we don't have to move geographically, but we have to move spiritually. It is essential. And he had to do it, and he did. And he went to a new place that God had for him. He had to trust God completely. People say they trust God, but unless they act on it, they don't really. And then again, Paul, another example, who was a Pharisee's Pharisee, had the scales put over his eyes for three days after he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and had his transformation. 
God did that to separate. He wasn't blind. He was just unable to focus on the world around him. And so God set him apart, separated him. After that experience where he had met Jesus and realized that he had believed all the wrong things, and he separated him so he could focus on what God wanted him to focus on, to let go of the old law and the old ways, the Pharisees' system, and accept the new covenant. And indeed, in those short three days with Paul, he had that transformation. And then the, the scales fell from his eyes. The separation from the world fell from his eyes so that he could go forth and minister what he had discovered. We have to understand what all these things mean, what the significance of these things are. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. In other words, he's talking about, as you read this whole passage, read that whole chapter, he's talking about the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Pharisees, the, the doctrine, the, the lies, the oppression of the Pharisees, the rules and regulations that they put forth. Because the old covenant is dead, is dead. In Colossians 2.14 and in Ephesians 2.15 and 16, the word says that Jesus put the old covenant to death in his flesh and nailed it to the cross. How much more clear could he make it? I mean, it's not, it's not a difficult thing to grasp that concept. But we have to live it. In 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, meaning the letter of the law, the old covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter, the old law, the letter, kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter of the law, the old rules and regulations, the requirements that were against us, they kill spiritually, but the Spirit gives life. Your past must be dead to you, as the old covenant is also dead. Christ has made you new, but now it is up to you to walk in this newness in this newness of life that he has given us. It's essential, and we can't just dismiss it. We can't just put it aside and, and think that it's, it's fine. In Hebrews 8, 13, the word says, a new covenant, it says in that he says, in that Jesus says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Vanish away. In Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. And he re renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is what he's talking about. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. The new man, the new man, the new creature in Christ that you become when you're born again. Jesus is the new and believing way, the new and living way, through the veil which is his flesh. This newness extends beyond just who we are now. It encompasses the continuing creation of God as he intends to wipe out all evil and crown his kingdom with new heavens and a new earth as one entity following the great white throne judgment. In 2 Peter 3, 11 through 18, he says things that we should take very, very careful note of. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, all the earth and all the heavens, he says, will be dissolved, being on fire. Since that will happen, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? 
Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, was written to you. As also in all epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Now this is the part you need to really take to heart which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of scriptures. This is the curse of false doctrine. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Really, really grab hold of this and let go of the past, all of the past, the old covenant and your past, in order to become the new creature in Christ that he has made available for you to be. That includes ceasing to identify yourself with the old covenant, to become the new wineskin filled with new wine. Move forward every day in Christ in the newness of life in him. And remember, the better you know the word, the better you know God. Amen.